Hi, can you hear me? Anybody there? Hello. Anybody there? Okay, today I'm going to continue with the energy thing. Uh, it, it, please watch the video, the previous videos, if you uh, need some background on this. Basically, I'm just continuing where I left off, and uh, the, the guys who were part of it can join when they start. So in any case, I'll just continue where I left off and everything will be fine. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is open up the PowerPoint and just continue as if someone is here. So basically I'll just go through it and explain it to everybody how this is gonna work. So uh, basically let's, let's continue here. Okay. Um, Okay. okay, so basically what I'm going to do is fit it, continue where we left off here. Okay, and now what we're gonna do is essentially start work. So basically I'm just gonna continue, continue with this and start where we are first regarding this. Okay, so basically what I'm gonna start with now is talk about the first law of thermodynamics. And if you remember what I was talking about with last semester regarding the nature of uh, the, the law of mass, mass conservation, it's really important to understand the nature about how they kind of interact with each other. So what I'm gonna do now is, is refresh your memory about this. You got the law of mass conservation And then the mass conservation essentially involves that matter is not created or destroyed. Created or destroyed, just redistributed. Redistributed. Okay, so basically we've got two aspects to that. And uh, basically it's important to keep that in mind regarding how we, how it, works with this uh, regarding the nature of energy in the first place. And the first law, law of thermodynamics is very, very important to understand that energy is the same thing. It can get converted, it gets converted from potential energy to kinetic energy. That's just how it works. And uh, basic or back again, kinetic to potential. 
affect the potential. But basically the key thing is with all this, energy is, is not created or destroyed. It merely goes from one form to another or one place to another. It's very, very important to understand this. Okay, so now let's continue where we left off. Now, the energy of the system plus the energy of the surroundings always equals zero. And basically when you get a change in the system, the system energy will flow to the surroundings. In other words, the energy that's in, in the earth will flow to the space around the earth. Okay, so essentially the earth has energy that goes to atmosphere around it or outer space. Or in the case of the sun, that energy goes to the earth as part of it. So basically you've got two aspects to guarding, each of them flowing back and forth and the, the total is zero. And it's really important to understand the nature of that. So the, the change in energy of the systems is a negative energy for that of the surroundings. So if you got a burner burning natural gas or propane, basically that's the chemical reaction that takes place. You have a certain amount of potential energy here. This is potential energy of composition. And then it goes to kinetic which is the heat here. And this also has some energy of composition associated with this. So the total is gonna be the same for both. You've got the potential energy that's still in the water and the carbon dioxide, but it's hard to get at. Okay, and in this case, this is called an exothermic reaction. The chemical, the chemical energy lost by the combustion equals the energy gained by the surroundings. And it's really important to understand the nature of how that works. Okay, now another form of it is the change in energy equals the heat plus the work. And heat basically again is, is essentially the, the transfer of energy from one place to another. The work is force over distance. So essentially you have work equals force times distance. Delta E is a change in an internal energy of the system. Q is a heat exchange between the system and the surroundings. And work is the work done on the system or by the system. And essentially in this case where the gas expands, the work is the, the force here, which is the pressure, this is the force aspect and the delta V is the distance. So basically those are equivalent to each other. And this is when you have a gas expanding against the cylinder, for example, like in an automobile engine. Okay, so basically the work done by the system on the surroundings is a negative value. The work done on the system by the surroundings is positive. The work absorbed by the system, heat absorbed by the system is an endothermic process and the heat absorbed by the surroundings is an exothermic one. So let's, let's talk about work here. Essentially the work, the work of this system, and it's important to understand the nature of how this works is force times distance, or in the case of pressure, and pressure is essentially in the collisions this is pressure is the force in the collisions. Force in collisions. Okay, and then the change in volume is the distance. So if we look at a piston, the initial, the force is the pressure pushing that piston up. And uh, that's the difference. The change in volume is the difference there. So there's a distance aspect in there. Hi, Bev, how are you? Sorry, we started late. No problem. Uh, I, I just did a little, you could go back to it later and, and look at the beginning, but I just started early kind of where we left off. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, it's fine with me. Okay, good. So this, uh, if you have any questions, 
uh, from this point, just ask and, uh, and I'll answer it. But you yes, see sir. here where you got the force and distance. What's the force that's going on the left, the left, the left uh, uh, piston? It's happening on the left p p piston. What what is that force doing? It's the force is basically compressing it, increasing the pressure. Well, yeah, before the initial, but after the initial to the final, what's the force doing? I don't Essentially, know. you're heating up the cylinder when that happens, or the gas is exploding in this. Like this is gasoline okay. burning. Okay. Okay. And so, what is what is the uh, force inside that going to do? It's gonna. What happens to the piston? Look at the piston. What happens to the piston there? It presses and then go back again. No, 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 no. Going from initial to final, what, what happens to the piston? You're thinking ahead. But in this case, what happens with the piston? The piston goes out, correct? Yeah. Yeah, you got more volume in there. That's, that's filled up with the gasoline. So essentially, you've got extra CO2 plus water in here. Instead mm -hmm. of on this side, you just have gasoline and oxygen. Uh oh. You get it? Yes, sir. So basically with this and the change in volume is important here, but this is pushing the crankshaft. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And I recommend you do a Google search on internal combustion engine and uh, on Wikipedia, you can do that and it'll show you diagrams and everything. It's really cool how this kind of works together. But, but you can see from that, just that description the work is what's needed with the gasoline combustion engine. Essentially, you want work from it, not heat in this case. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if we get more specific regarding pressure, the pressure is the force over distance squared, right? Mm -hmm. And the volume is distance cubed, right? Yes. So it ends up being force times distance, which is equal to work. So they're equivalent there. So you can kind of see how those two uh, things interact. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Good, okay. So here, the delta, delta V, the change in volume is greater than zero. The, the total is less than zero. The work on the system is a negative value. Okay, so essentially the work on the system is a negative value but the work on the surroundings is positive and that pushes, that pushes the piston out, which can enable it to go out into the crankshaft and then turn the wheels. Okay, so the, the change in work here, that is not final minus initial because it's a little bit more complicated than that because you've got distances and forces involved and they're not, necess they're not necessarily final because the path does matter in those conditions. Work is not a state function. Now let's look at a more example. A sample of nitrogen gas expands in a volume from 1.6 liters to 5.4 liters at constant temperature. Now in your section last semester, did you talk about the gas laws? Yes, sir. Okay, what would cause that expansion in volume to go from 1.6 to 5.4 liters at constant temperature? What would cause it to expand? The, the pressure, if the pressure decreases, that kind of cause that? Yeah, the pressure on the, on the outside decreasing, right? Okay. And so basically the other aspect of it too is it, <coughs> it could be you're adding gas to the system also. Mm -hmm. But in this case, when we're talking about a sample, it's constant. So basically the pressure on the outside goes down and that means the balloon gets bigger because the pressure goes out. It's just like a helium balloon expands as it goes up in the air, even though the temperature might not be very different. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So what is the work done in joules if the GAN expands against the vacuum or against the constant pressure of 3.7 atmospheres? Well, then, then you start with the formula there. The work is equal to negative P times V to figure out what the volumes are. And the P is zero. So you have zero, there's zero joules when it's the 
there's no, no outside pressure involved. That's why it's very easy for a gas to, expa uh, gas to expand to the point of escaping a balloon. And if, if, the, if the atmosphere is effectively zero outside a helium balloon, what's gonna happen to the helium balloon as it rises up in the air? If essentially the atmosphere goes out into space, what's gonna happen to that helium balloon? It's gonna lose air. Yeah, it'll break. Okay, and the helium will escape and just escape into things. There's nothing holding the volume to be essentially there because there's no atmosphere. But if it's in the atmosphere and it goes to, to you know, one atmosphere, then 0.5 atmospheres, et cetera, it then goes up. But if you look at this problem, for example, when you've got the change in volume is 3.8 liters, the pressure is 3.7, you put that in there, and now that's liters atmospheres for that. And then that is a conversion back into joules where basically you have the conversion factor, which is 101.3 joules per liter atmosphere. So basically there are uh, conversion factors that are usually on a chart. Now, if Dr. Do you have Dr. Powell or Dr. Gerhardt next semester? Dr. Gerhardt. Okay, so he'll probably give you that constant. Okay, and okay. a problem. So just get ready to uh, do that kind of problem if you have this constant given to you. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, does that make sense? How, how, do you follow the logic in this discussion here? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So, so basically the leader's atmosphere cancel out. Now, chem chemistry in action making snow when the Q is zero. Why is the Q zero when, when uh, water is sprayed through a thing into very cold air? Why is the Q zero? in order to make it in order to make the water cool down and become the same as the, the ice yeah, as the surroundings right so basically there's no heat involved it just it, it just quickly goes to ice because the outside air is less than zero degrees celsius okay and basically the change in energy is delta zero that change in energy is less than zero so basically the chain so basically you get snow under those conditions and the c there is uh, is 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 essentially the nature of the thing unfortunately this chart it doesn't make clear what the constant is and i find these kinds of slides annoying that that the c there isn't very clear <laughs> okay but but basically it has to do with the heat heat exchange in that situation now, the next aspect is the whole concept of enthalpy. And when you have delta E equals Q plus W, this again is the heat, and this is the work associated with this. There's another factor that com comes in at constant pressure. Enthalpy is defined as Q, is defined as the change in the heat. Okay, that's the heat exchange that happens. That's the Q. And this is called enthalpy. Now, part of why Dr. Gerhardt and Dr. Powell decided to have this be in the second semester is the next aspect of thermodynamics is the whole concept of entropy, which will come up a little later in another chapter. Okay, uh -huh. so basically there's an entropy aspect too, which is another law of thermodynamics. So you got entropy next. But basically enthalpy is the first part when you talk about it for uh, general chemistry one, because basically with chemical, with heat in reactions or dissolving something, the work is zero. So basically when the work is equal to zero, when the work is zero, then you're just dealing with Q and then delta H is the only thing that's involved. And that's what's involved in most chemical reactions like that happen in the body or in a beaker. Why does a chemical reaction that occurs in a beaker, why is work zero when it's in a beaker? Because there is no any type of efficiency that happens when- Yeah, there's no change in volume or anything else other than gases coming off. Yes, correct. And when it's totally open to the atmosphere, the gases just escape. There's no work there 
involved. Mm -hmm. There's no pressure holding those individual gas molecules of carbon dioxide or, or, or hydrogen coming off or any other gas coming off in a chemical reaction. Okay? Okay. So basically delta E by definition, and I'm, now I'm gonna race what's on the slide. Delta E is defined as H equals negative uh, uh, delta H minus PV. And if this is zero, if that equals zero, if that equals zero, essentially the change in energy is the change in enthalpy. They're the same when work is zero. And with most chemical reactions that occur in the body, work is zero. But what's involved with you picking up a ball with your hand? Is work zero? No. No, because the muscles are forced to act and then they contract and then basically they get some work out of the system. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the body is an efficient, very efficient machine in, in uh, kind of making this kind of relationship. Okay, and so delta H equals the change in e energy plus PPV and enthalpy is used to quantify the heat flow into or out of the system in a process that occurs at constant pressure. That would be like any chemical action that occurs in the atmosphere, okay? But if you have the, the pressure changing, then that's a matter there. Now, what, what is different about occurring in constant pressure? What is the difference with that with an internal combustion engine? Does that reaction occur at constant pressure inside the cylinder? We saw the cylinders before. Does that encourage it at constant pressure? Yes. No, why not? Because what, what happens after this, after the piston goes out, what does the crankshaft continue to do with the other pistons? They keep breaking down the rest of what the gasoline is left because the gasoline breaks on the break down in the second piston then the CO2 basically released out on the water stayed there for, for cooling well, down. Well, yeah, a few moments, but the, there's six cylinders in the engine, right? Mm -hmm. So when three cylinders are, fi are firing, what's happening to the other pistons? If you got a six cylinder engine and three cylinders are firing, the, the pistons are going out. What's happening to the pistons in the other one? The other they're ones in, mm -hmm. and they're sucking gasoline and oxygen into it. So basically, that's the fuel valve, and and with modern engines, it's fuel injection. It gets directed directed into the cylinder when it's it, it's already exhausted the thing because there's a valve that lets the carbon dioxide and water vapor out of the cylinder at when it goes out, right? And then there's uh -huh. another valve that puts the gasoline and oxygen or air into this cylinder, and then it's compressed, and then the spark goes off. So there is some work there. Because the constant, there's pressure constantly pressure uh, moving, okay? That's the work that's involved in an engine. So not only does the work involve turning the wheels, but it also serves to push the cylinders in on the other ones that have fired just recently. You understand? Yes, sir. Now, what's better with an eight cylinder engine versus a four cylinder, or say, what's better than an eight cylinder engine versus a two cylinder engine? Which is the smoother engine? Be logical. The eight? Yeah, why? Because everything is, there's a lot of them, that means everything is gonna go in order and there's gonna be more, like more work, that means there's gonna be more power and all these different things. But instead of two, two would not have that much of efficiency as eight. Right. There's everything. That's correct. And it's also jerky. That's why lawnmowers might have a two, 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 two cylinder engine or a four in some cases, but basically it is necessary for them to be eight. That's just extra. Because the mm -hmm. only thing that's happening with the lawnmower is it's turning the blade around in a circle. Okay, but automobiles usually need four to eight cylinders. Mm -hmm. Now, now, why does a super race car need sometimes get sixteen? 
because it needs to be so fast. Yeah, it's very, very good. You get more power out of it too, and it even gets smoother. The engine even gets smoother as it's going. So in some respects, it's interesting. Now I've got a little assignment for you, Bev. I can write this down, Wankel rotary engine. Wankel, W-A-N-K-L-E. And look that up after we're done, sometime this afternoon. Yes, sir. It's really cool how that works, but basically it, it's just different. It's just a different way to get uh, work out of the engine. But I'm not gonna go into it here, but that's an engineering question, but, it, but it's fun anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, so basically when you've got uh, delta H, it's the energy of the products minus reactants. Now what's the energy that's in the products? Sorry, what's the energy that's in the reactants here? This would be like what's in what's in methane, okay? There's mm -hmm. energy in there too. The products would be CO2 plus water. So essentially, if you were to draw a diagram, and this is delta, this is H, okay? And essentially you start off here with you start off here with the methane plus oxygen. There's a spark, and this is called the activation energy, activation energy. That's what, the, that's what the spark is for. And then the reaction goes, and down here is CO2 plus water. Which has more energy? The, the H, the CH4. Right, correct. And so basically the H, this is going down to here. So the delta H is a negative value. So do you see how the delta H is a negative value here? Yeah. Okay. Now, why with burning a uh, burning of methane in a burner, why why is work zero? Because there's no any type of efficiency. There's no any type of kind of like movement. Correct. Uh, uh, other than the molecules themselves, there's no pressure holding those molecules of CO two or water around the system. It's all done out in the open air. Yeah. Okay, so it's all about the, it's all about the uh, energy from the, uh, from the reaction itself. And that's what's particularly cool about chemical reactions that, are, that occur in the atmosphere, okay? However, if they occur out in space, there are rocket engines that work out in space, what's involved there? When work. a rocket engine goes off in space, what, goes, what happens there? Is, is heat much of a factor when it's out in, in space? No. No, because it's all at near absolute zero, mm -hmm. okay? But out in space, what does happen is there's work involved because it's pushing the rocket forward and the gas, the CO2 and, and H2O are going out the back. That's particularly when you've got a rocket engine that is liquid hydrogen and oxygen, like in the space shuttle. That's what it uses for fuel, even when it's, uh, you know, going out into space, or or it might be kerosene or some other thing along with liquid oxygen. But but when things are out in space, it's easy to keep it liquid because it's cold out there anyway. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's continue with the slides now. Okay, now heat given off or absorbed during the reaction at constant pressure. And essentially, this is an example of this. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got ice melting here. The ice is going from H2O solid to a liquid. What has to happen for that to occur? Heat. Goes into it, right? Mm -hmm. And what that does is break the bonds between the hydrogen, uh, between the water and the ice, and then talks about, and then moves it to a liquid, causing them to move. And when we get to the chapter on liquids and solids and talk about phase transitions, this is this is thing, and this is called the delta H of fusion. And it could be either of melting or of uh, freezing. So this is melting or freezing. Mm -hmm. Now, which one is this one that's on the left? Is that melting or freezing? That's melting. Right, correct. And so uh, freezing would be the other way. Okay, the delta H, uh, the pro H of the products is less than that of the reactants because the, 
that reactants were uh, essentially the, uh, the, the, the product is a liquid in this case. The delta H is less than zero. Oh, again, this is a problem with the slide uh, because basically in this case, the, the energy is higher and uh, I, 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 I've got to fix this. This is reactants and this is products. The delta H is uh, essentially, the delta H is positive in this case because it's going up. See, it's 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Mm -hmm. That's the heat of fusion or the melting of, of the water in that case, okay? So unfortunately, these slides are weird. But with this other one here, you got the burning of methane given off of the surroundings. And here the delta H is negative. And essentially it goes that way. And essentially the, the, the reactants the reactants, the, the H involved there to the products is going the other way. And this is exothermic. This is endothermic. Okay, now, is the delta H negative or positive in this case? Well, let's just look at the example there. The system absorbs heat so it's endothermic. So the delta H would be positive. You get that? Yes, sir. Okay. And so 6.01 kilojoules are absorbed for every mole of ice that melts at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. Okay. So that is the heat of fusion, the delta H of fusion of uh, fusion. And when it's positive, it, it's melting. Okay, here is delta H negative or positive? Negative. Negative, very good. The system gives off heat, something's burning. And so the delta H is less than zero. And then you've got that value related to the reaction that's burnt, burned at 25 C in one atmosphere. So basically this is a standard heat of reaction. This is called the delta H of reaction or heat of reaction, heat, heat of reaction. Okay. Or if you were to put this in this, this value would be CH4 plus 2O2 goes to CO2 plus H2O, 2H2O, and then plus 890.4 kilojoules per mole. So plus that, and it's positive on that when you put it in the equation because that, that energy is given off. Now, how would you figure out for two moles of methane, how much heat is given off for two moles of methane? If you change this to two, what's gonna to happen to this value? The value will be doubled. Correct. So that's where that's where um, that, that's where the uh, the things get in there regarding stoichiometry. Okay. Now the stoichiometric conversions always refer to the number of moles of substance. So basically, when you have one one there, if you reverse the reaction, the delta H changes. So this is the delta H of freezing the delta H of freezing, but again, it's called fusion, but it's, it's freezing in this case. Okay, and I put that in parentheses, but this is a negative value here. If you multiply both sides by this equation by factor N, then delta H must change by that factor. And so basically, if you have two moles of ice melting, it's two times that that's uh, the heat that is uh, required for that to occur. The physical states of all reactants and products must be. Yes, question. No, sir, I don't have questions. The physical states of all reactants and products must be specified in the thermochemical equation. So that it's important to have the labels in there 
this S and this L because that tells you what's going on specifically with those reactions. Liquid and gas. Now, what is this thing here? Liquid to gas. This is called the delta H of vaporization. Vaporization. Now, what does vaporization mean in this context? Turning something from liquid to gas. Yeah, very good. Up into a vapor. Right. Okay. You're essentially going from liquid. If you if you've got it in a burner or a boiler, it's going from a liquid to gas and the liquid water is converting into steam. Now, how much heat is involved when 266 grams of white phosphorus is burned in air? Okay, so basically we take P, P4 plus oxygen, okay, goes to the uh, reaction, okay? We don't quite know what it is, but this problem will tell you what it is when we do it. So I'm gonna erase what's on the slide and we'll work the problem based on this. P4 plus 502 goes to P4O10. This, is the, this would be the equation that's given to you, uh -huh. okay, along with the number, and then you'll be asked to do a problem. Now let's work a problem here. How do you figure out how many moles are in 266 grams of white phosphorus? You convert the whole thing to moles. Correct. So we have 266 grams of grams of P4, and you convert it into this is grams of P4 per mole of P4. Now, now, uh, if you have a periodic table handy, I don't have one here. Uh, what is what is the uh, the molecular mass of phosphorus? If you got your textbook, just look in the open cover. I don't have it, Professor. It's in my. Do you have a periodic table there handy? One of my ones I may have given you in the lab? No, sir. I don't think so. Do an internet search quick. Just, just pull up a thing. It's easier for you to do it than it is me. I could do it quickly if you want me to. I would try to do it. It's better for you to do it anyway. You're the student. Mm -hmm. Phosphorus. What's the molar mass of phosphorus? This is why you're always given a periodic table in general chemistry too, also. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's 30.97. So Okay, so it's 31. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically it, it, 31 times four is 124. Okay. Okay. Then that converts it to uh to moles. The grams cancel out. You have moles there. And then for every one mole of P4 of P4 reacting. It, it gives minus 301.3 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So essentially, this is the heat that's involved there. So times that, essentially the moles cancel, and then you'll get that amount in there. And basically, let's work the problem without my handwriting now. Okay, 266 grams of P4. One mole of P4 is 123.9. 303 kilojoules per mole of P4. And your grams cancel, moles cancel, and then you're left with kilojoules there. See that? Mm -hmm. That's how you would solve that kind of problem. Sure. Should be the number negative or positive? Well, in this case, the delta H would be negative, yes. So the whole converting, it, the solution should be negative 
Well, in this case, you're just using that number, but but properly, it should have been a negative number in there too. So basically, uh, they're just doing H, but the delta H would be negative because it's it's energy given off. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay, now comparison between delta H and delta E. If you burn, uh, if you react sodium with water, you'll get that and delta H is negative 367.5 and it gives off hydrogen gas. In this case, is there work involved? No, sir. Look at, look at the cylinders there. Is there work involved? Oh. Yes, there is yes. work. Okay, so basically, when you have it done in a cylinder, that that uh, that cylinder will expand because the atmospheric pressure is what's pushing it down. Okay, and that that would be just like the reaction of gasoline, gasoline plus oxygen. Okay, and then you've got uh, water, water, and CO two inside it. CO two on this side, so work, work is involved there. So in this case, delta H minus PV, one mole is twenty four point five liters at one atmosphere. So basically, P delta V is in there. You have one atmosphere and twenty four point five liters is added to that, and so delta E would include both of them here, and so you get negative three seventy. Uh, kilojoules per mole, but but this portion is work. Okay, it's not really reflected in, in the heat aspect of it, and and that's only with a closed system where you've got a piston holding it down like that, and the thing would expand. You see that? Yes, sir. Okay, and an example there is that here. Now, if you remember the definition of calorie, that is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of what? One, one gram of every one centimeter. No, no, for the definition of calorie, going back, mm -hmm. what's the definition of calorie? What does that involve? That involves water, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in this case of calorie, it's one gram of water instead of substance. Okay, so here they're talking about specific heat of the substance. And of course, there are other values, like there could be iron, aluminum, other things like that. You see the difference? Yes, sir. Okay, so here are specific heat of common substances. You got aluminum, gold, graphite, diamond, and then water is 4.184, ethanol is different. And the heat capacity, what's the difference between those definitions? It's the, dif the difference is basically quantities. Correct. So instead of one gram, it'll be an amount, any amount. And you bring the number of grams in there also. So of a given quantity and, and the quantity is not necessarily given to you. And basically the definition of that is related to all those things. So Q is equal to mass. Okay. Q, it, 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 the heat capacity, Q is equal to the heat capacity times the change in temperature. And basically that's the same thing as say, saying here when you have uh, when you have a one calorie, that would be equal to the mass times one calorie per gram degree Celsius, gram degree Celsius, okay, times the change in temperature, which is in Celsius. So you see how that works out. This this the mass here is in grams. So this grams cancel this cancels, you're left with calories. So that's kind of related to it. You see how those kind of things go hand in hand there? Yes, sir. This is the specific heat. This is the heat capacity. So you've got to understand the nature of these equations. 
because in the book, there'll be sample problems using uh, heat capacity and specific heat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me erase what's on the slide here so you can see this part. Q is equal to C times T there. And then delta T is T final minus T initial. How much heat is given off when an iron bar cools from 94 degrees Celsius to five degrees Celsius? How would you calculate that? They start with the value Q. Okay, what's the first thing you use? Uh, mass. Yeah, and that'd be 869 grams. Times the specific heat of what? The specific heat of the, the Time, iron. Right. Mm -hmm. Times the change in temperature. And the change in temperature would be 89 degrees. 89 mm -hmm. degrees Celsius. Now, does it matter if it's in Celsius or Kelvins? No, it doesn't. No, because it's a difference. You're talking about the difference there. And mm -hmm. basically, this specific heat of iron, you would get that from a chart. Oh. Because they calculated it separately. All right. Okay, so we look at specific heat of, of iron is 0.44 joules per gram degree Celsius. And now do you understand why, uh, why iron would be in joules and say waters and calories? What's, what, why would, why the distinction? Because why is it I, useful to keep water and calories? Because iron releases heat and heat concerns us be energy and energy it's the unit for energy is joules. Yeah, yeah, in this case it's joules, but why is calories more useful for Americans particularly? They might not care, they might not care in, uh, now where's your family from again, Lebanon? Egypt. Egypt, okay. Your family being from Egypt, they're not really gonna care about calories because calories is like an English measurement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically probably your dad growing up in, uh, in Egypt well, they were the they are the British education system too. The Brits helped them with the education system, so he might have learned calories too. So next time you talk to your dad, ask him if he if he learned calories or joules. Okay, that might be something to ask him. But the, the interesting history there. But the key thing is this: joules are much more useful when you're talking about other elements or compounds other than water. But calories is very useful, particularly when you're talking about food chemistry, because that's something that everybody understands because a thousand calories in this case is equal to one kilocalorie, which is one food calorie, food calorie. And that's important for many people, for, for uh, food scientists, as well as for biologists and others that have to deal with metabolism in the human body, because we're dealing with water in those cases. So you kind of see the functionality there. And, and that's more an American kind of history of this, is, is uh, doing, doing that kind of transition. So Q is equal to mass times specific heat times the change of temperature. You plug the values in there. You have a minus 89. Why is it minus 89? Because there is heat that has been released. Yeah, the heat is going down. Also, the temperature is going down from 94 down to five. Okay. And so there's 34,000 joules that goes into the, into the water in that case or into the air. Constant volume calorimetry is the way this is done to uh, essentially uh, figure out how many, um, how many uh, calories are in a food item or any, any stuff that's reacting. And essentially you get a calorimeter which is essentially isolated from the rest of the system, a thermometer into it, and then ignition wire that starts the reaction inside the, the vessel, and then a stirrer. And when the volume is kept constant, essentially you've got the Q of the system equals the Q of the water plus that of the bomb plus the reaction, and no heat enters or leaves there. The Q of the system is zero. 
So the Q of the reaction is water minus that of the bomb, okay? And the Q of the water, M mass times delta S times T. The Q of the bomb is C to the bomb times that. That's the reaction at constant volume. And when you're dealing with constant volume, that's the reaction that occurs inside the body because the volume is essentially considered constant. Well, in a closed vessel, I should say. That, that, that's when the volume is considered constant. But when, when you, essentially the reaction associated with that. Constant pressure calorimetry, that's when it's done it in, in, in uh, air, okay? Here in this case, the work is zero. No heat enters or leaves there. The Q of the system is there too. The water and the, and the calorimeter there is related to it. The Q of the water is mass of the water times the S times the change in temperature. And so the Q of the calorimeter is C of the calorimeter there. But with styrofoam cups, it acts as that. And then basically the delta H is Q in this case, because you have, a, you have essentially a constant pressure there. So basically the pressure, it, the, the pressure is a constant pressure and that would be at atmospheric pressure. And that's the nature of reaction occurring in the body too. You got atmospheric pressure essentially. So there's certain amounts of heats involved in, in chemistry, heat of neutralization, where you'd react an acid with a base. And you saw that with the lab last semester, uh -huh. where you reacted, uh, uh, where you reacted HCl with, uh, with, with, uh, with a base. You remember that we had an experiment where we got uh, heat, heat, heat going up? Yes, sir. And then heat of ionization, which would essentially be, uh, with an acid, uh, adding adding acid to it like HCl plus a liquid, you get the the H plus heat diffusion, heat of vaporization as well, and ionization in this case also. This is in solution, but it could be in the gaseous state too. And then heat of reaction is this, and then you got a negative value associated with that. So that's certain examples there. And then the food here, this has to do with the food calories, essentially one, one big C, this is a food calorie. Uh -huh. Okay, and what's neat about this, and I believe in Egypt, if you look at a label in Egypt, they look like this too, right? Do you remember? I think so. Yeah, why do you, why do you think they took the American system and have these kind of nice labels? because this is gonna be the common thing around the whole world. Yeah, yeah right, right. And when, when I was working in Iraq, even, even the food that came from Iran, because the Americans were good friends with Iran before the Ayatollah Khomeini came in, basically the, uh, the US government helped the, uh, food, the food people in uh, Iran. And then later on, Iraq took it also. But the thing is they came up with the same label. So it was really cool to be able to see uh, food in Soleimani, when I came into Soleimani, food that came from Iran had the same labels on it. And it, it, was, it was kind of like an American thing. They want to pretend that the Americans are the enemies of Iran when in reality they're using something very, very American in their labels. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> but when it works, you use it that way. So, so thanks. Now, how do you think they got the heat of combustion of an apple being minus two? Where, where do you think they got that? How, how did they determine that value? By calculating the calories. Yeah, but how do you think they, they, they could figure out that thing? What kind of calorimeter would they put it in to calculate that? They Easy start burning, they burning the They start burning the apple to see how it's going to work. Yes, correct. They just burn it out in the bomb calorimeter, in a calorimeter of sort. And basically they can determine it almost exactly. But the thing is when you're making up cookies that has to do with every single ingredient in the cookie, like say mm -hmm. for example, flour plus sugar plus egg. Okay, these all have specific, specific heats associated with each of them. 
So the flour has a certain amount of calories, the sugar also, and then they plug the recipe into it and they can figure out for each cookie how many calories they have. And, and that's what's pretty cool about food chemistry and how they determine those numbers. Okay. They, don't, they don't need to burn cookies in a bomb camera room to determine how many calories are. Right. All they have to do is add the ingredients together. Uh -huh. I get a recipe in, with the numbers along with them. Now, because there's no way to measure the absolute value of an enthalpy, must I, I must I measure the enthalpy for every reaction of interest? No, it's an arbitrary scale associated with it with a standard enthalpy of formation as a reference point because it's all about this change here. So basically the, the reference point is when you have a natural thing like CO2 or hydrogen or water or some other thing like that, the, the, uh, the ingredients that go into it, I'm not sure about CO2 though, but the ingredients here with this, essentially hydrogen, oxygen, other stuff like that, this is a compound too. So basically they all have standard enthalpy of formations and if something is in the natural state like oxygen gas, it's considered zero, but when it goes into water, it's not. The standard enthalpy of formation is the heat change that results from one mole of a compound is formed from its elements at a pressure of the, this here. So the standard enthalpy of formation of water, delta H of formation of water would be the, uh, one mole of compound from two hydrogens plus one oxygen goes to water, two H2O gas. And essentially these are gases associated with that. You have plus heat over here. And this is the delta H of formation on this part. The heat is just part that would go into the work or something like that. But the key thing is when it occurs in atmospheric pressure, then you essentially you have the heat coming off and the work is zero. But that is how they determine the delta H formation of water there. And these are considered from its elements. And the standard out for any element in its most stable form is zero. Now, why do they use that? Why do they use that definition? Well, the point is you've got to start somewhere. And when you essentially define something, this is defined as true. Okay, so that's where the starting point is. And then everything is compared to it. Okay, so essentially you got everything related to that there with oxygen is zero. With O3, it's 142 kilojoules per mole because ozone is not a naturally occurring thing of that. And basically that would be like essentially taking oxygen 302 goes to 203. This is a reaction. This is energy goes into it to cause ozone. Now, do you, do you know what an ozone generator is? I think so. Okay, where's the energy come from to get the ozone to form? Oh. Yeah, I don't know what is that. <laughs> from the spark. You, you have a spark in, in, in a thing. You have a spark inside. Mm -hmm. Like you can hear with some ozone generators, you can hear the spark inside. For example, why does the air smell uh, smell nice and clean after a lightning storm? Because most there's like burning that happened and most of the burning that happened caused the air to be clean because it takes most of the bad stuff out. And well, also a lot of hyd a lot of oxygen is converted to ozone, and that clean smell has, is an ozone factor. That's kind right. of how ozone changes different, but it's at a small enough level it's not dangerous for you. But that's part part of why the air is clean because ozone will then react with things and then cause them to precipitate out and clean the air when that happens. So it's kind of cool how that works related to that too. Okay. So for example, graphite to diamond, we have graphite to diamond here, carbon, uh, carbon goes to graphite, diamond, graphite to diamond, that, that requires energy for that to occur. 
So basically energy is required to do that. Now here are the standard enthalpies of formation for inorganic substances. And this chart would be provided for you if you had to work problems. So in, in, in the chapter 10 of our book, I would recommend you work some problems related to this if you want to. Uh, but uh, because Bav, you're just starting out early, just try three or four problems related to this. Don't try and do a lot of them. You can do a lot of them when Dr. Gerhardt or Paolo assigns them. Who are you taking next semester? Professor Gerhardt. Okay, so he'll, he'll have some problems related to that, but if you get a little practice in advance, it'll help you. All right, sir. And then you could ask me tomorrow if you have any more or on Monday, we'll do the next one on Monday. Yes, sir. Okay, now the standard enthalpy of reaction is the enthalpy of reaction occurs at one atmosphere. And basically these examples are related to that. And essentially this has to do with the products, the delta H of the products, delta H of the products minus the delta H of the reactants. Okay, that's the delta H of the reaction. And essentially that has to do with this diagram here where you have methane plus oxygen uh, on this thing goes up like that and then down you have CO2 plus water over here. This is the, uh, this is the, this is the reactants and this is the products. And this, this difference here, that is the delta H. And this value was usually be negative with that reaction. And that's what you would determine regarding the reactions that occur uh, like in a beaker. And, and I hope during the labs this next semester, we'll do some reactions where you measure the heat change. Um, I, I've done it in general chemistry, one in other schools, but I'm not sure as to whether we're going to do that this semester or not. I hope, I hope uh, Dr. Powell come, came up with a lab doing this kind of uh, uh, thermochemistry example. It's, it's really great how it works with just a, uh, a styrofoam cup. Okay, so now Hess's law, when a reaction is converted to products, the change in enthalpy is the same whether it takes one step or a series of steps. Okay, so for example, if you have a cookie plus oxygen goes to CO2 plus water, is it all in one step for your body for that to occur? No, it's technically, yeah, it could be a one step. Well, it, well yeah, it could be if you burned it in, in a bomb calorimeter, right? Mm -hmm. Then it would be one step. But in the body, is it is it one step? No, it's different steps. It's multiple steps, but they all add up to be the same. That's what's cool about Hess's law. So basically, it, with with a, a bomb calorimeter, that would be the same as equal to uh, um, the body energy happening in the body. It's just a matter of this is many steps, and this is one step. That's essentially what the what the rule is talking about. Enthalpy is a state function. It doesn't matter how you get there. It only matters where you start and where you end. Okay, now that, this is a good place to stop. Uh, what I'd like you to do is do some reading in your book and get to this point right at the end, right when Hess's law is defined. And uh, next time we'll go through some examples where we add up the different steps and you can see how it works. Because believe it or not, a, a lot of industrial chemistry is causing a reaction that goes some, uh, uh, from reactants to products, but it takes multiple steps to get there. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And I'll use some examples on Monday. Okay, any final questions of you, Bav? You, you're the only guy today, so I'll, if you have any questions that came up, this. Shoot. Yes, sir. I don't have any questions. You know what I mean? Okay, very good. So we're all done for the day. I will see you.
uh, uh, we'll do it again on Monday, and maybe Aim, Aim or others will join us. Sure. Okay. Is that okay with you? We will do it on time at 11 o'clock on Monday. I just had to go to Sam's Club today. <laughs> no problem. All right. Very good. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too, sir.